Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Des Moines Church of Christ. I'm so glad that you've tuned in with us here once again, and I hope you get inspired by the message from God's Word today. And I hope you enjoyed the worship singing from my buddies at the Dallas-Fort Worth Church of Christ. They do such an excellent job with worship there, and so I've been missing the singing, as many of you have, and I thought we could just kind of borrow it there from them. So that was really excellent. Thank you to all of you who provided that. But before we go one step further, I have to take this opportunity to wish all of our amazing moms out there a happy Mother's Day. And I'd like to ask all of you moms who are watching to go ahead and stand up at this time. Okay, yeah, really, that's you. Go ahead and stand up, even if you're all alone, okay? Go ahead and stand up. We just wanna honor you before the Lord. So go ahead and stand up. I can just picture all of our awesome moms just standing up as you're watching this. And I'd like to read a passage in God's Word where God spends almost an entire chapter just lifting up how amazing you moms really are. Let's read it here together in Proverbs 31 in verse 10, beginning. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She gets up while it is still night. She provides for her family. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat of the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Amen and amen. I love that passage. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. And that's exactly how I feel about you, Barry Lusk, okay? My, uh, the, the mom in our house, my wife, I, I love you. And you're just an amazing mom. And I hope all of the, the dads out there and the husbands feel the same way. And then I like where it says, honor her for all that her hands have done. And really that's a biblical command that reads the same every day. We should honor our moms every single day for all that their hands have done, but especially on this day, just give this whole rest of the day to mom and honor her and lift her up and just see how special you can treat her. We love you, we do honor you, and we thank God for all of you. Okay, well, now we're going to transist into the sermon for today, and we're in the midst of a series of sermons focusing on one action we can take that can literally and directly affect every area of our hearts and our lives. And of course, that one action we've been talking about is prayer. We're calling the series The Marvel of Prayer. And so far, we've done three lessons. If you haven't listen to those lessons or watch the videos, please go back on our YouTube channel here and check them all out. They'll really help you uh, to have a great foundation and understanding of prayer. So in lesson one, we talked about that, the foundation of prayer and saw how it really is not in what we do, but it's in who God is, that he's a God who cares and he's a God who hears. And that's why we pray. And then lesson two and three, we talked about the effectiveness of prayer. Because a lot of times we wonder that. Well, is it really effective? Effective at what? And so we took two sermons to talk about that and saw how effective it is at divine intervention, at building a closer connection with God, bringing about a greater peace in our lives, providing a clearer perspective on the big picture of life, 
and giving us a stronger resolve. So I hope you've been seeing how effective prayer is in your life. Again, the goal of this series is that we tap into His divine power by praying more, with more quality, more understanding, conviction, and passion, as well as more quantity. Just this week, I joined a, a Zoom house church group of our young professional ministry, the Yo Pros. I love that group. And they were sharing about how this series has helped them so far and how it's impacted their prayer lives. And I jotted down some of those real comments. This is exactly what they said a week ago. One said, knowing that God cares and God hears has brought more life to my prayers. I feel like I can really be myself with him. It's cool. Another said, this focus on prayer has helped me to become less independent and more self-reliant. Another said, before I was leaving God voicemails, but now I feel like I'm really talking with him because he cares and because he hears. Another said, it's been inspiring to think that I can really influence God. And yet another said, I've been learning that not to treat God like a genie, but like a friend with whom I can share everything. Okay, those are great comments. And I love hearing that. I love hearing that people are not just being entertained by the messages, but they're really putting them into practice and it's making a difference. Just yesterday, my wife was having a, an appointment with her doctor, just a, a virtual appointment. And at the end, the doctor was just kind of opening up and sharing some things that she's been going through. And she asked Barry if they could pray together. And Barry said, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to pray for you. So Barry prayed for her and then afterwards, she said, you know what, a lot of times I pray with my patients, but this is the first time that someone's actually prayed for me. And it really meant something to her. And Barry was sharing that. It's really cool. Let's just continue to tap into this power, this marvel of prayer. Well, now we're going to go into lesson four and talk about the essentials of prayer the essentials of prayer. And today what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on four characteristics of prayer that can make our prayers as fruitful and effective as possible. Okay, that's something that I would really wanna know. That's something you really wanna lock into. Well, is there something I can do that can make my prayers more effective and, and more fruitful? Yeah, there is. Now, up until now, the focus has been really on God and on prayer in general, and that's the most important thing. But now we're talking about our hearts and our actions for the first time, because those two make a difference. The Bible does teach that there are some specific ways God wants us to pray, and some specific qualities of heart that can magnify the impact or the effectiveness of our prayers. So let's take a look at some of these essentials of prayer. The first and the most important, belief. Belief, look at these passages. First Mark 11, verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Ooh, that's good. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Matthew 21, verse 22. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what, the, what was done to this fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Wow. James 1 in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Man, these are amazing passages of scripture. All of these verses connect prayer, belief, and fruition. And you kind of get this general formula, belief plus prayer, equals receiving. Belief plus prayer equals receiving. Seems like a simple enough formula, but it can be really confusing at times, right? Because sometimes we ask, well, we say, well, I asked, God, I asked, I believed, but I didn't get it. So what's up with that? 
And so we read these passages and we're like, well, what's going on? I thought I believed. And then we start blaming ourselves. Maybe I didn't believe enough. Maybe I didn't believe enough. And then we just kind of lose faith and we wonder like, what's up with this formula? Is it true or is it not true? Well, it's important to understand that these verses, they do express the general impact and the power of faith-filled prayer, but are not intended to be foolproof formulas. Belief absolutely affects the effectiveness of prayer, but it does, it does not absolutely guarantee the answer we desire. Okay, you get that? We can put it up here. Belief absolutely affects the effectiveness of prayer, but it does not absolutely guarantee the answer we desire. There's obvious exceptions where we can believe and we can pray and then we don't receive what we pray for. There's some obvious uh, exceptions, like what if a cruel villain prays fully believing, I pray that everyone in the world will die except me. Okay, that sounds crazy, like some John, uh, James Bond fiend or something like that, okay? But, but there are people, man, if there's people that would take guns and shoot people, I bet there's people that would pray sickness on others. There's people who would pray for, for ill will on others. Well, God is not gonna answer those prayers even though they believed. Or what if two people pray for the exact opposite thing? You ever prayed for your sports team to win, okay? And you ever think there's people on the other side praying for their sports team to win? I pray for the Chiefs, okay? I pray that they'll win the Super Bowl. Well, I pray for the Patriots to win the Super Bowl. Well, both of those prayers can, cannot be answered, right? Even though both parties may really believe when they pray. See, God didn't invent prayer as an easy means to just kind of sidestep some things. Like, let me give you some example of this. God didn't invent prayer as an easy means to indulge our selfish nature. Give me a million dollars. Okay, okay, I gotta be honest. I've at times played the slots, okay? I was in Colorado, okay? They had this this uh, this place, Blackhawk, and you go play the slots. And, and I go up there and sometimes I play, play the slots and I pray, okay, God, if you give it to me, I'll tithe 50%, you know? And, and then it just doesn't happen. Sometimes I even said, I'll, I'll give it all, you know? But, but it just doesn't happen. But God didn't invent prayer as a means to indulge our selfish natures. At the same time, he didn't invent prayer to take freedom away from others. Maybe you're praying for some girl out there to fall in love with you. Well, God is not gonna take away her free will. He's created her with that free will just to answer your prayer. And again, kind of like my other example, maybe she's praying that you'll leave her alone, <laughs> okay? So he's not gonna answer those kind of selfish prayers all the time. He's not gonna take freedom away from others in answering those prayers. He also didn't create prayer to shortcut spiritual principles like responsibility or obedience, okay, like this. I didn't have time to study for my exam because I was gaming all night. So God, just give me an A. Just give me an A on this test. Or, or maybe like, I didn't have time to work out, so I just pray that you'll build up my muscle and help me to lose fat. Okay, God didn't create prayer to just sidestep or shortcut certain spiritual principles like that. He, he, he didn't allow us to just have this selfish little means and this, this means to accomplish worldly purposes or selfish purposes. And he's gotta manage the prayers of everyone all over the world in all of his will for the entire planet, present as well as future. But he does allow man's will to influence him. He just didn't create prayer to allow man's will and wisdom to govern the universe. That's why we have him. That's why we're not God and he is God. So he didn't create prayer to allow man's will and wisdom to govern the universe and thank God for that. So these verses are meant to be taken within the context of being disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, within the realm of the kingdom of God. So the prayers should be, should be Jesus-like. That, that's the whole point, that we're in Jesus' kingdom. We're disciples of Jesus, we're followers of Jesus, and so he's the one that's teaching us about prayer. The goal of our prayers is that the prayers are Jesus-like. But even then, 
even if they're completely Jesus-like, our requests are not guaranteed. Think about it. Even Jesus asked for things that were not answered the way he wanted. Can you think about some of those? Okay, that's a good kind of a little riddle, you know, Bible knowledge trivia question. What are some things that Jesus asked for in prayer that he did not receive in the way that he asked for them? Okay, look at a couple examples of this. How about this? Matthew 26, 39. May this cup be taken from me. This is what he prayed. He prayed before the cross. He prayed for it three times. May this cup be taken from me. I pray you'll take away all this trial and all this, this challenge, this, this incredible tough time that I'm about to go through. Well, God did not take that away like he asked. Or another one, John 17, verse 21. He's praying for all believers and he says, may they be one, Father, as we are one. He prayed that all people who would believe in him would truly be one to the same degree that Jesus and the Father in the Trinity are one. Well, look at religion in the world today. Look even amongst believers. Look even within a congregation or within a, a house church, a really small family group or Bible talk, and you can see that that prayer is not always answered. So our prayers should be Jesus-like, but even then, they don't command God. Our requests must conform to God's overall wisdom and his overall will. Our requests have to conform to God's overall wisdom and will. Well, then what do we, what do we pray and how do we really believe? What does it mean to believe if there's all these kind of qualifying factors? Well, look at a great verse that talks about this. In 1 John, chapter 5 and verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So here it talks about the confidence that we can have, it talks about the belief that we can have. We must believe that God hears. We must believe that God cares. We must believe that God considers. We must believe that God tries to answer our prayers. And so we must believe that prayer really works. But again, he's got so many other people praying and so many other things to consider. So what does it mean to believe? Believe God hears, believe God cares, believe God considers, believe God tries, believe prayer works. And the fact is, the more you believe, the more effective your prayers will be. The more you believe, the more effective your prayers will be. Look at a second essential of prayer, devotion. Colossians 4 verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Romans 12 verse 2, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Acts 2, 42, an example in the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts 1, 14, talks on, talking of the apostles and their wives, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Colossians 4, verse 12, another one, Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And look at the words that are used in these few verses to describe how we should pray or how those people pray. They're either given as commands of the way we should pray or examples of how our brothers and sisters in the first century prayed. These are, prayed. These are the words, devote, faithful, constantly, always wrestling. Man, it's not just a quick little prayer, but they're calling for true devotion to prayer, and that's why it's one of the essentials. If it's effective, if prayer is effective at divine intervention, developing a closer connection with God, finding greater peace, and a clearer perspective, and a stronger resolve in your Christian life, 
why wouldn't you devote yourself to it like that, right? I mean, you think about it, if it's really that effective, why should there even have to be commands to be devoted? Well, because we have sinful natures and because we get distracted, okay, we all get a little spiritually ADHD and the world has so many temptations and distractions that we can easily lose sight of that. And that's why the appeal to focus on in, to devote yourself to prayer so that you can benefit and others can benefit from the true effectiveness that it has. If you think about it, if you just had one hour in a day, what would be the best way to spend that hour on a grand eternal scheme? What would be the best way to spend that hour? What could possibly be better than prayer? What could possibly influence things more than prayer? I remember seeing this example in a really profound way or an example of this principle in a really profound way. Back at, at Cal Berkeley, right before we got to Cal Berkeley to lead the campus ministry there, there was there a lot of really smart people in our campus ministry and a lot of smart people in general at Cal Berkeley, but this one guy was going for his PhD. He's a Chinese student and he's going for his PhD and everything came down at the end to this one test where they give you an hour to work on solving an unsolvable problem. They give you an unsolvable problem and then they test to see how far can you get? What can your mind do? How much can you reason and work through this? They know it can't be solved, but, but it'll give you a great, give them a great opportunity to see how you think and it forces you to really think deeply. So this one guy, this one brother, goes in for this final test. He's got one hour and they, they put him in this room. He's got his pencil. And, and he's got the paper upside down. And they say, okay, go, you have one hour. And he bows down and he prays for 45 minutes. No kidding, 45 minutes of that hour, three quarters of the hour, he just prayed. And then he turned the paper over, reads through the problem and just started writing. And he literally solved it. Okay, this brother solved the unsolvable problem. So time was up and they come in, they get him, they go, okay, so what did you do? And he goes, I solved it. And they said, no, no, really, it's unsolvable. Let's see how far you got. And he goes, no, I solved it. They said, what do you mean you solved it? He said, I prayed, God gave me the wisdom and I solved it. Okay, man, what an example. Now, it's hard for me to say, okay, all you students out there, imitate that example, okay? All your parents would get really mad at me. But man, that's really believing in the power of prayer and spending that one hour really well. So think about it, we have 24 hours in a day. So much time to do so many other things, but not at the expense of that most important hour of prayer. Not that it has to be an hour, but not at the expense of the most important part of your day to pray. That literally is the most important part of any of our days. So let me ask you, are you devoted to prayer? What would God say about your prayer? Would he say that, would he use the words that he used in the first century here? Would he use those words like devoted? Wow, he's faithful. Wow, she is constantly praying. Wow, he's always wrestling in prayer. Would he use those words? Or would he use words like inconsistent? sporadic, occasional, drifting, spotty. What words would God use to describe your prayer life? He knows because you're praying to him. Just like your wife knows how much time you spend with her and talk to her and listen to her, God knows how much time you're spending talking to him. What would he say about your prayers? The fact is, the more devoted you are, the more effective your prayers will be. Okay, a third essential of prayer, righteousness. This is a cool one, this is a challenging one. Proverbs 28, nine. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. Wow, to think of prayers being detestable and for God to say someone's prayers are detestable, that's intense, but that's what he says. If someone turns a deaf ear, to his instruction. Another one, Isaiah 59. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Wow, we talk so much about how God hears, but when there's a wall of sin between you and God, he says literally, he will not hear. Look in John 14, another one, the New Testament, verse 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing. And they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I'll do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask him for anything in my name, and I'll do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. What's cool about this is Jesus is saying, hey, ask me for anything, I'll do it. And here's the things I've asked you, my commands. I want you to do those too. There's like this, this conditional relationship that, hey, you have to be taking me seriously in order for me to be taking you seriously. So it's interesting to think about that. It's interesting to think about the connection between our righteousness, between our walk with God, and the effectiveness of our prayers. Now, the fact is, we're never perfect on our own, right? And we're all cleansed only by the blood of Jesus. But just as hidden, unrepented sin can thwart our salvation, can block our salvation, so unrighteousness, hidden, unrepented of sin, can block our prayers. If it can block us from going to heaven, it can certainly block our relationship with God in this world. So righteousness is a key essential to the effectiveness of prayer. And the fact is, the more righteous you are, the more effective your prayers will be. Okay, let's look at a fourth and final essential persistence. Persistence. And we'll look at this passage. I know it's probably hard to read there, but I thought I'd put it up anyway. In Luke 18, in verse 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That's a cool introduction right there. Jesus wanted to show his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. So he shared this parable. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Ooh, man, what a parable. This is such a powerful teaching from Jesus. And it talks about this essential of prayer from the, from the mouth of Jesus himself, persistence. He said they should always pray. They should not give up. Later on, he says, won't God answer those who cry out? They cry out to him day and night. You don't get the idea. It's like, hey, God, help me here. Hey, how come he didn't answer it? But he's like talking about crying out day and night, always praying, not giving up. Persistence demonstrates faith. And persistence in prayer demonstrates passion, both of which really stir the heart of God. And a lot of prayer, it's stirring the heart of God. It's riveting his, his attention. It's showing him how much you really care, how much you, you really want to see these things happen, and how much you're really thinking about him and about others, and the, the, the prayer itself that you're, you're striving to attain, the thing itself you're striving to attain through prayer. And so persistence in prayer demonstrates that faith and that passion, and those stir the heart of God. So he says, just don't tire of praying. And you know, there's things in all of our lives that we pray for, and we pray for once, and we go, okay, it didn't happen. We pray for again, and it didn't happen. And it gets kind of funny, you go, well, how many times do I need to pray? It's interesting, when you look at Paul, and he talked about his thorn in the flesh, he says, man, I prayed that, that God would remove it three times, and he didn't. So you get the idea that Paul just stopped praying about it. 
well, that's really kind of interesting, you know? But, but it does say that God told him, hey, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not gonna give you what you're asking for. So he was told that, so I guess maybe that's why he stopped praying. But, but here Jesus is saying, always pray and don't give up. We have things that don't get answered right away the way we want. How quickly do you give up? Here Jesus is saying, don't tire of praying for something. It may take days, it may take months, it may take years, it may take decades, and, and it may be that the answer to prayer is found in the way that you glorified God by believing all the way. Because this passage just ends with him saying, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? The very fact that you are continuing to pray with faith, that in and of itself is the goal of life, to really have that faith in God to the very end. But I've prayed for things over and over, years and years, before I've seen them answered. Like, for my kids to become disciples. Man, I prayed that for, for over a decade for each of them, and I continue to pray, not just that they'll become disciples, because they are, but that they'll make it to heaven, all the way to heaven, that's what matters the most. Or for my migraines, and I had chronic migraines for, for years, actually for decades. Chronic migraines, there's times I had what's called a, a migraine lock. 31 days, I'm locked into a, a significant migraine. And this was like incapacitating me, and I would pray, and I'd pray for years and years. At one point, the elders in Denver, they put some oil on me, okay, like James talks about, anointing me with oil. They prayed over me. We prayed and prayed, so many prayed, and that prayer wasn't answered. Eventually, I move here to Des Moines, and it's amazing that the change that's been brought about in, in my life, uh, maybe because of moving here, because of some new medication, because of diet changes, but because of God answering the prayer through those things and others, that while I still occasionally have migraines, they're very occasional. They're, they're never chronic like this. My life is completely changed, and I know it's just God answering the prayer and blessing me because honestly, me and so many other people prayed about it so much. So persistence. And see, the fact is, the more persistent your prayers are, the more effective they're gonna be. The essentials of prayer, belief, devotion, righteousness, persistence. Again, today we focused on our hearts and our actions regarding prayer. But there's so many essential qualities that we could have talked about. You can add to this list, like brevity. Jesus says, don't think you'll be, you'll be heard because of your many words, okay? So you gotta be careful there. Selflessness, that's an essential quality. Joy, there's so many other things the Bible talks about as essentials of prayer. So maybe you could add to that list. Be a good uh, Bible study or a good discussion to have with your groups about adding to the list what are some essentials of prayer. But I wanna caution you. Don't overly focus on yourself or you're gonna miss the whole point of everything in prayer to focus on God. And that's why we spent the first three weeks just talking about prayer and talking about God, not talking about ourselves. And yet it is important that we also take this time to talk about ourselves in these essentials of prayer. So again, the goal of all this is that we, me, you, pray more with more quality and more quantity. My prayer is that these thoughts will help you and your prayers to be as powerful and effective as possible. Amen. God bless you in that. Now, we have some discussion questions again this week to ask with your spouse to consider yourself, your roommates, or your small groups. Number one, if you could truly change just one of the four essentials of prayer covered in this lesson, which, which one would produce the greatest change in your life? Belief, devotion, righteousness, persistence. Which one for you would produce the greatest change in your life right now? Number two, can you identify someone to become your prayer partner for the next two weeks so that you can help each other grow in your prayer lives? So pick someone 
to be your prayer partner and set up some times to pray together. You can go for prayer walks with a six foot distance, okay, or you can just pray over the phone or you can pray uh, through Zoom or video conference, FaceTime, whatever, but pick someone and make sure they pick you to be a prayer partner and pray together with them for the next two weeks. It'll really help you to tap in to this power of prayer. Okay, now we're gonna go into communion and say a prayer for communion. Then I'll give a quick sneak peek of our lesson next week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for being such a caring God. You care about us enough to create this whole avenue of prayer to give us the opportunity to talk to you whenever about anything. You sent Jesus down so that we could be forgiven. So even though we're not righteous in and of ourselves, in, in which case you wouldn't hear our prayers, we can be forgiven and you can hear our prayers. But God, I pray that if there's anything that's out of line with our followership of Jesus, that's holding back our prayers, reveal it to us. Help us to repent of those sins right now, to realign ourselves with Jesus and be his disciples so that our prayers will not be hindered like that. Thank you for Jesus, for his death, burial, and resurrection, for his body that was given up for us. And as we take the bread, we think about that. For his blood that was shed for us, as we take the juice, we consider and think about that. As we take those emblems, I pray that we really will draw closer to you and closer to Jesus. We love you. We thank you for this incredible communion this fellowship that we can have with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, sneak peek of next week. The marvel of prayer, whoops. Okay, the marvel of prayer. Let's pull it up here. Sorry. The marvel of prayer, the practicals of prayer. So next week is the conclusion, and we're gonna get really practical, pretty basic, but just talk about how to pray. Okay, in light of the foundation, in light of the effectiveness, in light of the essentials, how do we do it? How do we really pray? Tune in next week for our exciting conclusion of the Marvel of Prayer series. God bless you.